alongside Janine Turner, that's me, and Kathy Gillespie, where Kathy and I, along with Constituting America's student ambassadors, Dakari Chapman and Tova Kaplan, <laughs> chat with experts on hot topic issues. This is gonna be so much fun. So today, our hot topic is the Morse code, and our expert is Professor James C. Klinger. Woo! So Kathy Gillespie is co-president of Constituting America and one of the six and uh, and one of 16 private citizens, listen to this, serving on the U.S. Semi-Quincentennial Commission, helping or organize the celebration of our country's 250th birthday in 2026. So everyone say semi-quincentennial. Semi-quincentennial means 250th birthday in 2026. So that's a very prestigious thing she's doing. Only 16 private citizens. Now, Dakari Chapman. Our Constituting America student ambassador, Dakari Chapman, is 16 years old and is currently, get this, a junior full-time college student. Yeah, go figure. In South Carolina, he has won Constituting America's We the Future contest twice once for best PSA, which is a public service announcement, where he reminded viewers the Constitution is an American thing, so know it. And twice for his short film, Man on the Street. He is also actively involved in our National Youth Advisory Board, and he's a working actor seen most recently on HBO's The Righteous Gemstones, and on April 15th on Netflix's Outer Banks. There he is on the set. Dakari wishes to be an actor, but also a politician, but says you must be an actor to be a politician. <laughs> so true. Now, Tova Love Kaplan. Tova is also 16 years old and lives in Illinois. She currently serves as the National Youth Director for Constituting America. My daughter was the first and Tova is the second. Very prestigious National Youth Director for Constituting America, and runs the National Youth Board, the National Youth Advisory Council, or the National Youth Advisory Board. She runs it. Uh, Dakari's on that board, and Dakari's an ambassador. She is a three-time winner of the We the Future contest. Just three years ago, when she was 13, she won the entrepreneurial category, where she created a marketing plan. Uh, she won for PSA the next year, entitled Know Your Rights, Read the Constitution, and this year she went for STEM, where she created an app. Get that. She is passionate about educating and empowering young people to use their constitutional rights. We are so lucky to have these two brilliant young American citizens on our board and part of Constituting America. And you'll just, you're just going to see later how brilliant they are. And now our special guest, we have a 90-day study. Our 90-day study is to found, it's online at constitutingamerica.org. It starts every President's Day. We're in our ninth or 10th year now. And uh, this, we're, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. One of the articles, which is going to essays, which is going to uh, be published on April 8th. And it's entitled, Samuel Morse Since the First Telegraph. And our brilliant expert tonight is Dr. James C. Klinger. And he's a professor in the Department of Political Science and Sociality at Murray State University. He's also the director of the Masters of Public Administration program. Dr. Klinger is the author of many, many books and has published research in a number of professional journals. Dr. Klinger is also the chair of the Murray Calloway County Transit Authority Board. All this is just very, distinguished, and a member of the Ethics Board for the City of Murray. He is also a past president of the Kentucky Political Science Association. Yay, Dr. Klinger, let's give him a big round of applause. Everybody, welcome Dr. Klinger. Thank you for having me. We're thrilled to have Dr. Klinger with us tonight. He's, we were talking to him beforehand, he's just brilliant. So. Dr. Klinger, I'm going to ask some questions. Kathy, our co-president, will ask some questions. Dakari and Tova will ask some questions. And at the very end, toward the end of the hour, we were, were going to ask you, our listeners, our viewers tonight, if you have any questions. 
So, Dr. Klinger, we were talking tonight about the Morse code. I just watched the movie Current War last night in preparation for this uh, about Thomas Edison and Westinghouse and their little patent war, really, about ACDC power and the electric chair and all these things that, that happened and their fight. To, everyone during this explosive time in our country were just, um, were just so excited and about the patent and that they could own the rights to their own works. And it was just an explosive time of creativity. So talk to us about Samuel Morse, how he had the idea, what, what was behind the genesis and the, the, the heartfelt passion of why he wanted to create something like this. You wanna start there? Sure, sure. Okay. Morse was someone who kind of came to the idea of the telegraph, the Morse code, by a, a strange route. I mean, he was largely trained and studied as a painter, as an artist. He was not trained particularly as a scientist. And in fact, many of our notable inventors over the years have had uh, backgrounds that are fairly diverse that would not lead us to believe they would be uh, particularly successful in invention. But uh, he uh, became somewhat disappointed in his career as a painter. He was, he was quite distinguished, but not particularly well paid. And uh, he had studied some science and some chemistry in particular uh, when he was at, uh, at Yale, where he went to school. Um, and then uh, after his wife died, uh, his life course sort of went in a different direction. He had been commissioned to paint a portrait of of Lafayette in Washington, D.C., and he uh, took a trip uh, to D.C. shortly after the birth of his fourth child, and he found out a few days later that his wife had taken ill and had died, and he was not even able to return home until after the burial of his wife, and he was grief-stricken, and uh, relatively short time later, he took a trip to Europe. Uh, mostly uh, ostensibly to study art, but perhaps also to take his mind off his troubles. And while on the ship and making the return voyage, he uh, fell into a conversation with a number of scientists who were talking about um, electromagnetism. And he got the idea that uh, messages, words, communication, what he called intelligence could be conveyed in a fairly simple and instant way across great distances. And he began uh, almost surreptitiously at first, although he talked to his friends, but he uh, did not make obvious his uh, actual experiments and work. Um, he began working on this project of the telegraph. And he took a number of ideas that had been developed by other people, uh, uh, people who were scientifically trained. And I can talk about those if you wish. Um, and he developed a device uh, that could be used to send signals across long distances. And he applied some uh, advances in uh, electrical technology to relay the electrical current across long distances. And uh, I think perhaps his most important contribution was the development of the Morse code which is a fairly simple but yet effective way to uh, con convey the written word. And um, uh, after a great deal of, of, uh, of hardship and a number of small demonstrations, he was able to um, convince Congress to appropriate uh, a certain amount of money that would fund the creation of a telegraph line from Baltimore to um, Washington, D.C., where he was able to transmit a simple message that convinced members of Congress of the um, uh, ability of his device to convey uh, these messages clearly and accurately over uh, a, a good distance. It's about 38 miles from the uh, beginning and end of that telegraph line. Let's back up a little bit, because I know we're getting to the big moment when, when he has his, and you can tell the fun story behind that, um, what, what he telegraphed, but didn't his assistant actually create a 
uh, an, an aspect of it. He and his assistant were able to figure out how to actually have it write something. Um, and then, and then more Samuel Morse actually came up with that code so that people could actually, when they sent this magnetism across, they, weren't those two elements that they actually created together, his assistant, he and yes, his assistant? Yes, you're probably thinking about Alfred Vail. Uh, prior to, uh, prior to uh, Morse's telegraph device, a couple of British scientists, Sweetstone and, and uh, Cook, uh, developed a telegraph that did use a needle to point to different letters of the alphabet. It also relied upon different uh, wires. So essentially each wire uh, would communicate a, a electrical impulse that would move the needle or certain combinations. So essentially it made, it, it required many different wires and many different electrical circuits to move the needle in a particular way, but someone would have to watch the needle and record the message. What Morse and his assistant, his name was Alfred Vail, did is develop a way to make a permanent record. And originally what Morse wanted to do, or what he tried to do is he, he had artist implements around. So he had a canvas and a sort of a, uh, a sawtoothed uh, metal blade and the blade would be put on a lever and the electrical current would make the blade go up and down and make marks in the canvas. Now, obviously that wasn't yeah. very effective and very awkward, but it still worked, but it, but it was very awkward. Uh, vale helped his assistant, who also was a, a business partner, uh, help to um, uh, create a simple lever uh, that would be stimulated by the electrical current and current would be sent with a, 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 a telegraph key. And the, the current would be uh, broken up into uh, either dots or dashes and the lever would go up and down and stay on the paper. It was a paper tape that was involved and that would form a, a record of dots and dashes, which could be read and could um, uh, be a permanent uh, record of the communication that had taken place. So it was a big- Just, just fascinating. Yeah, just, just fascinating to think that the human mind could think of that, you know, that this current's going to go through and then a piece of paper is going to do these dash and dots on a piece of paper. I mean, what a the precursor for all the great things to come. Um, I think we have a picture of him. Oh, gosh, look at him there. <laughs> I had found a picture earlier in his youth, but that must have been copyright. Look, there he is. Yeah, I guess that's the, the uh, oh, later in life, obviously. Right. There's this machine. What's that? I was just going to say that that is late in life, uh, probably when he was in his 70s. He was born, I think, in 1791 and died in 1872. I think he was just short of 81. But anyway, that's later in life. You see the medals on his chest. That he was given all kinds of honors from uh, a number of foreign countries, as well as accolades in the United States. And uh, he was, he, there's two or three famous pictures of Morse with, with those medals, wearing those medals. Because eventually there was a transatlantic line, but we won't jump ahead of that. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you one more question then I'll, uh, I'll toss it to Kathy, who will toss it to, to uh, Tova Dakari. Um, so, so go back now and tell us, uh, he created the machine and I guess he got the 30, and so he went, he, uh, did he have the patent yet? Or, or and like in other words, when he when he demonstrated to everybody and said those famous words, which I'm going to let you tell the story, had he, did he already have the thirty thousand dollars, and did he already have the patent at that point? Yes, he had the patent. It was going to be challenged later on, but he had a patent. He also had had earlier had a patent for something else as well. Uh, but he had the patent, but it was not uh, commercially successful yet. He had to prove himself. Um, in this case, b before Congress. And uh, he built the line. Uh, the, originally, it was going to be um, a buried cable, essentially, a buried electrical line. And uh, there, there was some water or something that got through the conduit, and so that wasn't working. So they built, a, essentially, the aerial lines that are more, most common in the United States today, which uh, uh, for telephone lines, of course. Um, so we'd have the poles with the horizontal crossbar and uh, the telegraph line would be suspended in that way. And he uh, a 
arranged for this demonstration before members of Congress. He had earlier had some demonstrations for other federal officials, but they did not involve a long distance transmission. Um, and at the time he had been living in the house of the, um, the, the patent commissioner, uh, whose name was Ellsworth, and uh, he had uh, gotten kind of sweet on the commissioner's 18-year-old daughter, uh, Annie Ellsworth, and um, Morse asked for her to choose the words that would be transmitted uh, between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. And uh, the words that she chose were, what hath God wrought, which is a quotation from um, uh, Numbers chapter 23, verse 23. It's part of the, the oracle of Balaam that uh, you, can, you can find in the Old Testament. And um, he transmitted that message and members of Congress were just astounded and amazed and thought this was uh, a wonderful um, advance. And of course, uh, a few months earlier, they, at least many of them, particularly the House of Representatives, had thought that his idea was crazy. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, uh, but, but they were mostly convinced. In fact, um, one of the members of Congress who had been most critical of the idea of this appropriation to Morse, uh, a man named Cave Johnson, later became Postmaster General and for a while at least was the uh, chief government administrator of the federal government's telegraph. The federal government did not control all the telegraph's uh, service in the United States at that time. Uh, in many other countries, the telegraph later would be essentially a state-run government function, but that was not the case in the United States. But nonetheless, the, the post office did have a have a have responsibility for a telegraph line going up and down the East Coast, and, uh, and that's it's ironic. It says here there was a, there was a tongue-in-cheek amendment to the bill. I don't know which bill we're talking about. Uh, it's, that's, it that's the appropriation the for the thirty thousand yeah. dollars. But that was before. Is, is that before he demonstrated it for them? Yes. yes. Okay. And there's this, and, and they, they a tongue in cheek amendment to the bill proposing an appropriate, this is from Dr. Klinger's essay, uh, proposing an appropriation to send messages through mesmerism. I thought that was kind of fun. Like they were mesmerized. So they sent it through what, mesmerism. They, what do they, you mean by that? What they meant was that Morse's idea was stupid and crazy, and it would make as much sense to uh, appropriate money for someone doing mesmerism or telepathy or whatever to transmit messages as it would be to oh. invest money in a telegraph line. So they, they little, they cool. made fun of them. <laughs> okay, Kathy, do you have a question for Dr. Klinger? This is fascinating, Dr. Klinger. Um, I had a question when you were talking about the Morse code, I read in your essay that the Morse code is sort of the precursor to modern day computer code. And I thought that was fascinating. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, the, the Morse code is basically using two kinds of signals, a dot and a dash. And of course, modern day binary, which is used in computer algorithms, is essentially sending combinations of zeros and ones. And all the communication, in fact, um, n not just computers, but like uh, digital television, uh, the, the, the screens that we have in front of us are essentially represented by a complicated assembly of zeros and ones that convey uh, messages about the content of the screen in front of us. In fact, even to this day, if you, uh, uh, do a search in a library database and look and talk about Morse code or something like that, you will see a number of different um, uh, references, citations to articles that have, uh, that are not about the original Morse code, but they are about the modern algorithms that have uh, family resemblance to the Morse code. So we could thank Samuel Morse for being able to have this Zoom tonight. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, maybe somebody else would have come up with it uh, if he had not, but um, but certainly it was a it was a big advance. A huge and, advance, and to think he if that had been uh, if he had had that he would have known about his wife. It 
could have gotten home in time. You know, right, and, and quite frankly, this was an enormous advance because the lack of communication caused enormous problems. In fact, I, I've, I've even read that in part the War of 1812 occurred in part because of slow communication. Basically, there was a dispute between the British and the United States, and the United States made certain demands, certain concessions, and the British eventually made those concessions, but they did not communicate that until after the United States had declared war on Great Britain. I mean, war could have been averted, and I'm sure it's not the only war or the only dispute that might have been averted had communication been faster. Wow. Wow. Okay. To Tova Kaplan, Tova Love Kaplan, um, our National Youth Director. What question do you have? 16 years old. These Dakari and Tova are 16 years old and could just rule the world. Um, okay. So Tova, what's your question for Dr. Klinger? Right. So first, I just wanted to say thank you so much. This has been really interesting. And as a side note, anyone who's watching, who's just been so invigorated by this technological discussion, consider applying um, for our STEM category for our We the Future contest. Um, I know I'm really inspired by this. Um, and I was just wondering, you, we were talking a little bit about the US, uh, the US government's attitudes towards this innovation, um, originally viewing it with a little bit of skepticism um, and amusement, but then transitioning um, to really admiring it and integrating it into our systems. And I was just wondering how historically has the United States um, attitudes towards innovation and science been different compared with other countries around the same time? And what could account for those differences in our constitution and international culture? Wow, that's a great question. Not necessarily easy to answer though. Right. Uh, the United States developed a patent system and that wasn't the first country, but it was one of the first to develop patents uh, that could be relatively effectively enforced. Although um, I will say that enforcement has been uneven over the years and there have been disputes uh, and Morse is involved in some of them and Edison and Bell and others as well. Um, the United States passed its first patent law in 1790 and then amended it in 1793. The relevant patent law uh, for Morse, um, at least regarding the telegraph, would be the uh, act enacted in in 1836, which established the Patent and Trademark uh, Office, which would examine applications for patents and would determine whether they were truly novel and if someone else had uh, already uh, sought a patent uh, for the same, essentially the same um, uh, invention. And then later on, if someone were to um, uh, use that patent, then they could be liable for a suit. What the patent did is essentially give fairly uh, exclusive rights to the use of the patented invention and to earn royalties for the um, uh, proceeds from any enterprise that used that particular invention. There's a famous quotation actually from Abraham Lincoln, who actually was the first president, only president, I guess, to gain a patent. And he said that the patent system added the fuel of interest to the spark of genius to create uh, useful, uh, necessary products. And without that patent, someone else could essentially steal the idea uh, behind the invention and make use of it. So it would provide, so the patent system provided uh, an interest, an incentive to to um, create new and useful things. Now, after the Civil War, the number of patents went up very dramatically in the United States. And also, uh, <laughs> perhaps unfortunately, the amount of, amount of patent litigation went up dramatically. Now, patents were not, patents existed in other parts of the world, but they weren't always enforced very well. And in fact, Morse had a patent for his telegraph in France but the French government expropriated it and took away any income that he could receive. Uh, in a couple of countries, both Switzerland and the Netherlands, the 19th century uh, abolished their patent system, which worked to their detriment in terms of, of innovation and so forth. 
Um, patent law, even to this day, is very controversial, and I don't want to get into all of that stuff right now. But um, I mean, it's a it's a it's a very controversial question today. But almost everybody believes we need some kind of patent system to um, motivate people and to reward people for creating some useful things. Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting that other governments have taken it away. Mm -hmm. um, like you just said that that you know because France had their 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 equality and their, their, their revolution, but very quickly they had a dictator again with all the Napoleons. And it's interesting that they took away the patent right to them. And I want you to quote that Abraham Lincoln uh, for me again, because that was a great quote. But, let's, but first I want to say that the reason, and this is one of the things we're talking about tonight, the reason a, a president or a judicial branch or a legislative branch can't take away our ability to patent our creations, which is the spark, whatever Abraham Lincoln said, is because we have it actually in our constitution, the law of the land, article one, section eight, clause eight. But that's one of the most amazing things about the constitution is that we actually, we, we may not have been the first country to say that you had the right to your patent, but we put it in our constitution so no king or queen or dictator or overbearing government could take it away. And here it is, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing the limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Uh, and mirror that, Dr. Klinger, with that great quote that Abraham Lincoln, I want to write that down because to me, this is the genius of America right here is that we had this in our constitution and we could, we actually then had, everybody was inspired by that spark that Abraham Lincoln says. What's that Abraham Lincoln quote? Okay, I'll, I'll quote it. It's from a lecture on discoveries and inventions from 1858. And uh, he was saying that before the establishment of the patent system, any man might instantly use what another had invented so that the inventor had no special advantage from his own invention. The patent system changed this secured to the inventor for a limited time, the exclusive use of his invention, and thereby added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. So that's the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. Okay, the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. That is a brilliant quote. And that is because we had it in our constitution. So, you know, hooray for our constitution, I think. Okay, so now Dakari, what's your question? Hello, Dr. Klinger, thank you for being here and thank you, Jean and Kathy, for allowing me to be on with everyone tonight. And I will second the uh, sentiments of my right-hand lady and say that if you were inspired by technology, hit the, uh, hit the, the button and, and submit your work for our STEM category for our contest. But Dr. Clear, I've been looking up some things. I'm really into like presidents and how they view things. And I was, I've been looking up some things about Morse and how he made the trip to, uh, in December of 1842 to like the Capitol to like string up electricity and make sure that they can, you know, get messages. And it says that in 1844, the news of the Whig Party's nomination of Henry Clay was telegraphed. And I was just wondering, how do you think that played into politics during that time? It amazed people. That particular message was before the one between Baltimore and Washington. But it, it really astounded a number of people. But it wasn't, it wasn't in front of the same crowd. And many people thought that, 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 that maybe they've got some kind of inside information. But but, he, but they didn't. I mean, obviously, it was real information. In fact, the Whig nomination was like on, on uh, there were multiple ballots. It wasn't the first ballot. It was a very surprising outcome and so forth. So it was, um, it, it, it made a big impression upon the, the people who heard about it. But uh, it took the, the later demonstration, I think, to convince uh, other members of Congress. But but that is also one of, the, one of the things that's interesting about technology. Sometimes it gives us information very fast and occasionally it gives it faster than we want. I mean, uh, in the case of elections, uh, television uh, news people could report uh, results from the East Coast 
uh, long before the polls close on the West Coast, and uh, and that might cause some problems for some of the uh, the people running for office on the West Coast. And so there's been an agreement uh, with television not to report results uh, until the polls close on the West Coast. But I think there was a very famous that everyone's holding up the newspaper a century later in, in, in response to what you're talking about, the elections, everybody needs to, to know. Was it Dewey? Well, was Dewey that? was said to win. Harry Truman held up the newspaper that declared that Dewey won. Yeah. But of course, yeah, 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 that's Truman what actually won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's an example of getting it wrong. Um, okay, so let's go to a question in our audience and then we'll kind of repeat the cycle here because there's so much more to your essay, Dr. Klinger. The stuff I will throw at you, uh, initially it wasn't so much a question, I was just going to pass along to the professor that uh, the Battle of New Orleans didn't have to take place if they'd had International Telegraph at the time, because right, the war had been good. settled a month earlier in a peace conference in Paris. That's and right. For the message to get there. That was one thing, but another one came up for me, uh, a massive solar flare. It's one of those ex-solar flares to my memory, the way they call them these these particular ones, they're always panicking in the news when the sun lights up and fires off something in the direction of Earth. At that time, it fired off exactly what they're afraid of, which was a, a major solar flare that went straight at the Earth. When it hit the Earth, it lit up and fried almost everything electrical that was, but there wasn't anything major that was electrical except for telegraph lines, and they went on fire. Mm. And everyone figured out how that happened later. The scientists figured out, well, there was a solar flare at that day, and that's what caused it. But if it had hit now, it would have knocked out all kinds of electricity worldwide. And that's mm. what they're always watching for, based on what happened at that time. What year was this? 1859. All these telegraph operators went crazy because mm. everything burned up and shut down the whole line all over the country. Wow. Wow, well, that's kind of what the Edison Westinghouse was all about, too, the ACDC currents and if things would catch on fire. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. That's really a story. Why did the girl who picked the first words who were over the um, telegraph, why did she pick those words? Well, uh, I can't say that I know for sure. Um, she, uh, I mean, Morse was... Uh, religious fellow himself, and she may have been as well. Uh, Morse is the son of a, a clergyman. Uh, the particular pa uh, passage uh, from the, the Old Testament is um, uh, from the story of Balaam and uh, Balak. And in that story, um, Balaam is uh, asked by uh, uh, Balak to to, to curse the Israelites and uh, and of course Balaam is uh, 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 persuaded otherwise by by uh, the angel or first by Balaam's donkey who's, who's, who's who carries out messages from God and then uh, at at some point in the in the blessing of the Israelites even though Balak did not want them he wanted them to be cursed uh, Balaam um, says what hath God wrought? And of course, that's the old King James version of that. The newer versions uh, of, the, of, of the Bible say something like, uh, what great things God has done. I mean, it's not a question, and sometimes it's depicted in, in text as a question, what hath God wrought? But it's really kind of an exclamation. It's a sort of a praise of the great invention. And of course, uh, I, guess, I guess Annie Ellsworth was um, uh, giving credit to God for this uh, accomplishment. I am so glad that question was asked by Isabel, and I'm very impressed with your astute knowledge on any subject that we throw at you, Dr. Pointer. So I'm very impressed with that answer. You better check. I might be just making all this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Talk about the industry here and how this affected industry. Oh, it was a, a huge advance for industry um, of, of all kinds, but particularly it was important for, um, well, any kind of industry that needed quick information over long distance. And it had an enormous impact upon railroads initially. It, was, it allowed railroads to coordinate the movement of trains. So well, they, 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 they wouldn't necessarily collide with one another, obviously, 
uh, in Britain, actually, where railroads began or developed before the invention of telegraph, or at least reliable telegraph, there were normally two tracks that went uh, to different destinations. One would be the eastbound, one would be the westbound, one would be north and south and so forth, so that trains would go in opposite directions. And of course, the cost of building tracks, uh, double of the amount of tracks, really was uh, a burden for the railroads. And in the United States, uh, from about the 1850s on, almost all train tracks were single track because they were able to coordinate the movement and we didn't have a situation in which um, trains would either have to stop and back up and go to a siding because another track from the opposite direction was coming along. The telegraph did that. Was able the telegraph to did that. And in fact, it was really a symbiotic relationship because in most cases, the rail, the railroads would have a, a right of way on either side of the tracks and they would normally uh, grant the right to build the telegraph poles and lines uh, right alongside the, uh, the rail lines. Uh, and so there's a very close relationship between them. Um, obviously, the, anything in finance, the fluctuation of the stock market, which would take place over the course of a, of a given day, uh, was very important for, for them. Um, any questions about price fluctuations in both factor and product markets, uh, information could be conveyed much quicker over greater distances. Um, sometimes more competition was created in certain marketplaces because people could see that um, if I order some product from a few hundred miles away, even with shipping costs, I can get a lower price than the product that's uh, provided uh, close to home. If they just know about the, prevalent, the, the presence of a, of a lower price or a higher quality product, uh, they could uh, make that deal. So anything, of course, that, that, that is important uh, uh, to have timely information was, was uh, of great use. And of course, it was, it was used and a great deal by the military in the Civil War. Yeah, right, 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 right. In the war, I've seen that, yeah. I, I mean, I've seen it in movies. <laughs> Since I'm an actress. You're not quite I've old. Seen it in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw him way back during the Civil War do that Morse code. And I was there. I was I was mesmerized there. Um, okay. Well, the military yeah, actually used the Morse code until about the 1990s. Uh, for uh, yes. For, so it's, yes. You don't have I saw that. a special. I saw a special that the actress is it who is the 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 famous actress was responsible in securing the Morse code so that it couldn't be picked up by enemies um, during World War II. And I be Hedy Lamar. Exactly. Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar. Lamar. She, and, and, uh, uh, she had a collaborator who worked on a uh, frequency uh, alternator so that the, the, she didn't alter the Morse code, but she altered the frequencies. She developed a device that would alter the frequencies with which the code was uh, sent over the air and um, and the receiver could could notice uh, could, could know uh, what the fluctuation would be and so the enemy would not be able to intercept the messages but the the uh, the troops on the same in the same side could get the information yeah the, the multiple way yeah it was really really fascinating thank you science channel or history channel wherever I saw that okay Kathy what's your question well, I was just going to bring up something that uh, one of our viewers had brought up here. Um, David Finstermaker, who's a great supporter of Constituting America, uh, just wrote a story out in the Q&A that kind of gave me goosebumps about, the, about how the Patent Office in the War of 1812 was almost burned down, but the head of the Patent Office made an appeal to, to not have it burned down. He said that the head of the patent office rushed uh, on his horse into Georgetown to stop the troops from burning down the patent office building. And he said that to the British that anyone who burned the patent models would be condemned by future generations, which is ah. really neat that even in, in war, they, they recognize that, that the discoveries that were patented, you know, even at that time, were gonna have such a bearing on our future. And, and, the, and the soldiers ended up not burning down the patent office, which is, you know. If only they'd done that with the great library in Alexandria, right? That's, if only. 
what we would know. Okay, uh, we want to try to get two questions in before we wrap up here. To, uh, to Tova, what's your next question? All right, so I was wondering, um, how did Morse's background as an artist influence his outlook on scientific discovery? I think it might have made him a little more uh, creative and able to combine different ideas and knowledge and skills um, from different places that uh, some people, I mean, not just scientists, but many people tend to have tunnel vision and we, we, we narrowly look at things and he was someone of a very broad background. I mean, he um, you know, studied at Yale, studied painting, but he also had an interest in chemistry. And keep in mind back in those days, um, chemistry was very important in um, electrical engineering basically because so much of the electric power that's used was uh, galvanic. It came from chemical cells or batteries and so forth. We, we didn't have the, the uh, alternating current uh, 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 that we had after Tesla and so on, but uh, it was battery run uh, electrical projects and so forth. But he, he had an industry in chemistry and he just ran into everybody uh, from different fields at, at Yale, and then later he went uh, uh, back to back to become a professor, not at Yale, but at uh, what I think was then called the the College of the City of New York, which is now NYU, in New York University. It wasn't called it NYU back in those days, but anyway, obviously back in the 19th century, universities universities were smaller entities, and faculty intermingled with each other and talked to each other and shared ideas and so forth. And I think all that experience was probably very useful for him in um, bringing together uh, ideas from diverse fields and crafting them into, into something special. Thank you. And not to mention that the, yes, thank you. So not to mention, I think that the, what, the darkness that he walked, I'm really, I really believe that the darkness that we walk through in our lives, all of us at one point or another leads us to some sort of enlightenment. And that darkness that he walked through with his wife dying probably was some sort of, you know, impetus for him and on some level emotionally as well. And, you know, I was thinking about uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a great artist who was also a scientist and right. probably a little bit Michael too. Um, okay, so Jakari, what's your question? Yes, um, I'm gonna, I tapped into the Q&A. Someone asked, uh, one of the viewers, how does our first law, page one of the US code annotated our first organic law, reinforce the purpose for which article one, section eight, clause eight was written? I think he's probably talking about the Declaration of Independence. I think if you open up the code oh. book um, and, uh, Yes, he says the Declaration. Okay, the Declaration of Independence, I see. Well, if you look at the Declaration, one of the interesting things is that it has a long laundry list of complaints about the king. It's really about Britain. And realistically speaking, it's largely about complaints uh, about the British Parliament, although the villain that's depicted in the Declaration of Independence is largely uh, King George. And one of the, the various complaints that they had uh, in the Declaration of Independence were about um, not just taxation without representation, the things we think about right off, the, right off the bat normally, but the various things that made it very inconvenient and difficult to run a civil society in, in America. Because we had um, a number of matters that needed to be dealt with in, by the British government uh, months voyage away in Britain. And it was just very impractical, it was very awkward and, and some would say tyrannical, but a lot of it was just very difficult for the American colonies to operate and to manage their affairs and so forth. When we get to the um, Constitution and Article One, Section Eight, and so forth. We have a listing of powers given to Congress to do various things and to do them presumably rather quickly. Um, maybe not as quickly as we could be. It could be done today, of course, but 
Uh, we didn't have to wait months and months for communication to take place between the 13 American colonies and the British government. Uh, we would be months distant away. Of course, one other aspect of the, of the telegraph, which is really interesting to me, is that now uh, we don't have to delegate so much to public officials. Uh, we do, perhaps, but we don't have to. Uh, in the, before Morse, before the telegraph, uh, especially the transcontinental and the, and the transatlantic telegraph, uh, the United States would appoint ambassadors to foreign countries on the other side of the world, as would other countries as well. And those ambassadors represent the United States, but it's not like we could, uh, the president or anyone else could tell the ambassadors what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. They were sent off to represent the United States, but we couldn't communicate with them for weeks or months. And now, of course, after we have transatlantic telecommunica uh, telegraph, we can communicate. The, the ambassador can send messages to, to Washington and the president or the Secretary of State or whoever can send messages back to the embassy um, in a very short period of time. And uh, a good example of that, and uh, a good example of that is the John Jay Treaty, or you know, mm -hmm. the treaty where that John Jay did abroad, and everybody was so mad when he when he mm -hmm. returned home. Right. What exactly was that, Dr. Klinger? He he, he was sent abroad. Mm -hmm. Um. What was that again? Define that for us. My understanding is that the treaty that was negotiated was not to the liking of um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, if I recall correctly. The French. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He thought he sided with Britain. He sided with they. They gave. They acted. They gave too much to Britain and the it, Jefferson. And there's this whole French fury going on because of the right. the revolution. Right. Uh, so communication might have helped, but you know. In that respect, maybe it was good we didn't have that communication. Think of, you know, he made a really good, you know, a decision in history that was probably a correct decision. And if the telegraph had been there and if the, he'd been getting all this influence from Thomas Jefferson, he might've had to have changed his mind. So who's to say? Okay, last question. Robert Zimmerman asks, I may have misheard, but if the patent was secured by the constitution, why didn't Morse make any money on this patent? Oh, he made money on the patent from the United States. He didn't make much money from the patent he had with France. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Because they took it back. They Right. They expropriated they it. it. They basically confiscated his invention. Because he was a king and he, he was a dictator and they didn't have it written in their constitution. Well, I don't think the constitution was <laughs> that much of a... Um, constraint on, on some of the French rulers and so on. Uh, well, exactly. But that's exactly my point, right? We have right. a law that our presidents have to sign. They, I mean, they have to swear that they'll protect our constitution and honor it. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's one of the things we try to say out there is to know that the constitution protects the people. I mean, thank goodness we have it. Uh, Jeanette, would you like to give a closing question because you're, you're with us this evening? What developed your interest in studying this topic, Professor? Uh, <laughs> I wish I could give you a, um, a very uh, impressive and exalted type of answer, but the, the truth of the matter is, um, you know, one of your colleagues, um, Amanda Hughes, asked me to do uh, some things, and I have kind of boned up on them a little bit. I, I, I am interested in I didn't know I didn't know much about the telegraph, but uh, I knew a little bit. And uh, once asked to do this, I uh, I learned some more. And I, it it is very interesting, and it's it's really it was it's extremely important in the development of um, especially the 19th century American economy and the rise of of uh, vertical integration in American corporations and so forth. It set it was involved in the setting of precedents and patent law that are still with us today still debated today and so forth so there's really a lot of kind of current uh, dispute and interest that carries over from the 19th century so there's a lot of things that i'm i'm learning i, I i'm squandering my my scarce funds these days i maybe not squandering but i'm using up my scarce funds these days ordering 
uh, books that deal with uh, um, uh, the rise of the telephone industry and things like that right now because of the interest that has been uh, sparked uh, uh, on this topic. So I, I want to learn some more about it. Well, that's why we thank you so much, Dr. Klinger, for all that you do with your genius for constituting <laughs> America that you don't have time and your, your intellect. And, you know, this is one of the reasons we're doing, we do our 90 day studies is to, is to think outside the box, you know, the box to, to sort of, uh, go, the constitution is, it, there's so many elements that arise from the constitution and all of our studies, the 90 day studies, for those who are joining us, they're at constitutingamerica.org. Soon they're going to be in book form. So you can order them as a book because we have so many fascinating studies over the years. And this one that we're doing right now, if you want to join us, you can backtrack a little bit or go forward with us. Um, it, all about these types of momentous moments in American history that often are not taught or people don't understand or they're considered passe, but they're actually really fascinating and very um, instrumental in the development of our country, such as the Morse code. So Dr. Klinger, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you to our donors who make this, this type of thing possible tonight. And I hope you're impressed seeing, seeing our fabulous expert scholar, as well as these two young, amazing, your Z generation, I guess, is what you are now, right? I always say, yeah, yeah, the Z generation. Look, we feel good about the future of our country with, and how, what a magnificent um, contribution you're making to constituting America that you, you continue to do. We're, we're just so lucky. And so thank you to all of our donors. Thank you for our attendees, everyone for joining us tonight. Good night. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>